The president has finally declared an emergency in the nationwide opioid epidemic, although it is qualified as a public health emergency rather than a national emergency as some would have preferred. The move is, in theory, supposed to free up additional funds and resources for places like New Hampshire, where we struggle daily with the fallout from widespread addiction to opioids. The question some beginning are to ask now, is this declaration too late? Today I'm lucky to sit down with three of the most influential women in New Hampshire politics who do not hold elected office. We have Chris Blevins, Stephanie Shaheen, and Renee Plummer. Thank you for being here, ladies. Good morning. Thanks Appreciate for having it. us. So this emergency has been declared, but you were here on this very set 23 months ago mm -hmm. uh, asking for this to happen. Two years later, what is the perspective, Stephanie? Well, you know, we needed this two years ago. We need it now more than ever. We've lost nearly a thousand people in New Hampshire alone to drug-related overdoses. And we really need people on the front lines with the resources necessary to get recovery, to get treatment, and ultimately to have some changes made in the way in which these medications are being prescribed so that they don't get into the hands of folks who ultimately will become addicted. Chris, what do you think? Did this take too long? I think two years ago we were begging and we've been very patient and that it's here what does it mean? Is it just words? Um, as an advocate, I'm very um, positive about the fact that the denial has been broken and that we have admitted nationally that this truly is what it is, which is an epidemic. And, you know, I just, I look at the big picture and I, I know that there's a solution to this because we're not dealing with a disease that doesn't have treatment. And why then are the numbers continuing to go up? Um, I'm encouraged regardless of whether, you know, a state of emergency had been declared that New Hampshire has stepped up and expanded treatment in such a way that is so powerful regardless of funding. Um, we have treated this like an emergency and I'm very proud of our state for doing that. Mm -hmm. And so many stories of success and, and progress, but also the problem persists, Renee. You know, it, it's always going to persist, unfortunately. You know, there's, uh, there's so many people that are working on this. Um, uh, John Delano, the DEA agent, you know, you have school board members, you have parents, um, uh, the government going after the pharmaceutical companies, which is a huge, huge thing. Um, uh, just talking about this, but you know, hearing that it's 140, 150 people every day that are overdosing on this, uh, this, this is all through the United States. And uh, you know, we all have to come together for one reason or another to fight this um, as much as we can. And I don't want people to sweep it under the rug. I know people are probably thinking, oh, this again. Well, excuse me, this is our state. These are our citizens that are dying. We can help them. You know, in, in some ways, we can give them give them some hope, and that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And this issue was an explicit campaign promise uh, on the campaign trail by President Trump in, in Portsmouth and in other places. He said we're going to stop the drugs from coming in, and we're going to get people help. Uh, we know that there's not a lot of money right now associated with this emergency declaration. Um, Chris, what do you think? This is it was a promise, uh, but the trend line does not look good right now for the president fulfilling that promise. Well, the answer is always, regardless of money, that it's it's a simple formula. It's mission over money, politics, power, and accolades for any of this. So if we keep the focus on saving lives, the big picture solution really boils down to one individual at a time and how we can, you know, ignite recovery and treatment options for that one person that's sick and suffering. And that will affect the big picture. Mm -hmm. And we do need resources. I mean, not only do we need resources to come with this public health emergency declaration, but just the state funding formula needs to be addressed. Just last week, the president decided to keep that formula in place. It was based on population as opposed to the states that are hit the hardest. We're only getting about $3 million in federal aid through that funding formula out of $500 million, and yet New Hampshire has been one of the state's hardest hit. We need that funding formula to change so we can get the resources on the ground here. And one of the trickiest parts of this, too, is, of course, we're involved in a political process, but the more that politics intrudes into this, it almost seems like it impedes the progress of what people are trying to achieve. A absolutely. You almost want it to just sort of set aside and say, let us take care of this ourselves. Don't make this political. Um, let's get the right people at the table to do something. I know that I had mentioned that we all were going to be here, and somebody had said, well, you know, if they can do something, God bless them, but, you know, it's going to be the same old thing. Well, you know what? 
we're trying, right. okay? You know, we, we're just not sitting back on our hands. Uh, we are trying to help. And those people that are sitting there watching this and pointing the finger, get up and do something also. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't uh, just sit there and wait for us to come to you. Get up, walk in, walk into your schools. Um, there's so many fights that you can help, and they should be doing this. Well, and, you know, we sat on this stage nearly two years ago, and then we saw firsthand that this issue knows no demographic bounds. It's not age, gender, health status, socioeconomic status. It's affecting everybody, from 75-year-old people to 16-year-old kids. And unless we come together in a way that says this is bigger than politics, this is about people and about saving lives, and if we don't do that, we're going to not, you know, the trends are not going to go the way we want. We really need to come together to change the direction we're on. And we need to take politics out of it. Um, what I use when I'm speaking to people that have sort of a, you know, something about this that, you know, they feel passionate about and they don't have like a big picture sort of attitude toward it, I say, okay, so let's put three people overdosed in front of you, all in cardiac arrest. You've got a Republican, a Democrat, and an Independent, and they're all dying. Which one do you save first? That's the question. All of them. Right. <laughs> there have been some ominous kind of indicators of late, though, not just with overdoses, but also public opinion. Uh, you see someone, an authority figure like uh, Manchester Police Chief Nick Willard saying he's disheartened in this fight right now because he feels like we're not making enough progress. What does that tell you about what we need to do? We need more people on the ground. We need more access to recovery and treatment. Ultimately, when we, you talk to uh, Chief Willard and the fire, you know, the fire department here in Manchester doing some very cutting edge work, but there aren't enough of them and there are too many overdoses happening every day. I hear so many stories, especially from our public health officials, our public safety officials, that they're having to go back to the same homes multiple times because we can't get people into recovery. You hear stories about people waiting too long to get into treatment. We've got to combat this right at the beginning as soon as an overdose is identified, we have to prevent the drugs from getting into the state. We have to make it harder for people to prescribe these medications. And, and you know, you're talking about treatment centers. What is the best treatment center? Um, I saw somebody the other day talking about a treatment center. He went in, and he's fine now. He's been um, on, in recovery for, I don't know, like 15 years. It took him three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer that 28 days. So what New Hampshire needs to do is you need those recovery centers, mm -hmm. places to live. You know, we're talking about the Farnham Center, Farnham right. Center North, um, a place that they can go to and almost retrain their brain, you know, retrain the way they were thinking. It's not going to happen in 28 days. Mm -hmm. This is where I want public and private funding to come and help set something up so these people have a place to live, you know? Right. And that does seem to be, you know, the, there is the, the treatment model and that needs to be in place on a wider scale, obviously, as we've seen, but there also, Chris, needs to be a culture change as well yeah. to help, yeah. you know, because this is a lifetime struggle. It, it really is a lifetime struggle and, you know, it's like we're continuing continuously needing to look deeper into the cracks in the continuum of care. And I see the two weak spots and where they are is initiating recovery in an emergency situation. So it's the people being, you know, revived by naloxone. It's the EMS is absolutely burdened right now. We need to support them. The emergency rooms are overflowing. So my, my whole thought going forward is initiating some kind of a community paramedicine program that sort of takes EMS and recovery coaching and merges them so that there's more support for those services. But on the other side, the weakness is in somebody gets treatment. They're in recovery. Addiction has devastated their life. They have nothing. We need life purpose coaching. We need recovery housing. We need to help them on their journey. We can't just help them, you know, get into recovery and then leave them with no resources because they're empty inside. They've lost everything in most cases. And I would just add, you know, ultimately, it starts with prevention. We need to get to children early, early, early. Early education is key to helping avoid getting on a path of becoming addicted to any substance. And we need to do more to bring resources to bear on that front so that we can help not just the children whose lives have been touched already by addiction, because maybe they have a caregiver who's coping with addiction, but those children who may be at risk later. If we yeah. get to them early, it'll help save lives. Renee, you mentioned the lawsuit against Purdue Pharma. Is that potentially a vector there for funding? to come in eventually eventually it should be yeah. it should absolutely um that that's where money should be coming from they should pay for this um and but two other things that i wanted to talk about is mental illness mm. you know you you now have addiction but then you on the other side you have mental illness and how do you understand 
mental illness. I mean, I, I think psychiatrists are pulling back. Um, our friend John Broderick, you know, is doing change direction, uh, trying to understand mental illness. Um, so. When you have a formula that's going to help somebody that doesn't have mental illness, how do you know that the person next to them is going to create, uh, is going to be part of the, the, the solution because they have mental illness? You don't know what to do with them. Right. And, 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 sorry, go ahead. But I have to also say one of the other things that I am so against is marijuana. It is the gateway drug, and I don't know why we have to keep on pushing this. Uh, and, and the people that are just saying it, it's not bad, you know, you have alcohol. Well, yeah, alcohol could be bad too. But opening up the gateway drug and having the kids all thinking, well, you know, it, it's just marijuana. Well, this is how it starts. Oh, my goodness. There are so many uh, people that will tell you stories, testimonials, that where did it start from? Just starting with marijuana. Mm -hmm. Chris, you mentioned the toll on the EMS workers. We hear yes. this phrase, mm -hmm. compassion fatigue, right. where you know they're reviving the same person over and over and over again. And it gets difficult for them to see past uh, what's going on. How, as a state, do we avoid compassion fatigue in this fight? <laughs> well, we, we bring in more support for our EMS. And I think that can be done um, by bringing people into the scene after an overdose to deal with it further and initiate the treatment. Um, their job is to revive and move on to the next and or transport to an emergency room. So there's there's that critical place right there where we can initiate recovery through the emergency medical system and relieve the pressure on our firefighters and on our EMS. I'm actually reinstating my emergency medical technician uh, certification right now so that I can get in boots on the ground here in Manchester and, and, and to see what's going on. We have to be able to look deeply and vividly at the problem in order to come up with innovative solutions. Amber's Place was an example of that. You know, forming a shelter where people could go to wait for treatment. Now we have a lot of treatment. And that shelter is still operating today. 3,000 people have come through it through the Safe Station program. Mm -hmm. So it goes on to serve. But, you know, it's these moments of need. When you look at somebody that's been revived by naloxone, they are in critical condition. They have just died and been brought back and we need to treat that very seriously and that is an incredible moment of interception right there to initiate the recovery process. All right, well, this is something we could discuss for hours but unfortunately we've run out of time for today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, uh, you, thank for you for your advocacy. Thank you. And we thank appreciate you. you being here. Chris Blevins, Thanks. Stephanie Shaheen, and Renee Plummer. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank